that I really enjoy with what you ladies do is you sing the hymns of the faith that I don't know. And I'm learning to um, really enjoy them the more that I am um, exposed to them. So let me ask you to take your Bibles today and turn to Romans. Very good. And um, we're going to what chapter? 16. 16. Uh, how many more chapters we got left? None. So tonight, today will be the last message in uh, the book of Romans. And I've called it the revelation of God. And uh, with that being said, while you're turning to the passage of Scripture, uh, I want to give a couple of things. One is mystery. How many of us like mysteries? You know, mysteries, you know, they're, they're fun to watch. They're fun to try and figure out. Uh, the definition of a mystery is something that is not understood or beyond understanding. That is according to Webster's. Now, the word mystery is used often in the Scripture, especially the New Testament. And in the New Testament, here's what the word mystery means. Something not once known, but now revealed. Something that has not been known, but is now revealed. Um, and, oh, and by the way, I want to, if you know the answer... Good for you. If you don't, you're going to learn something extra. Uh, who wrote the book of Romans? I don't blame you. Don't answer. Uh, his name was, look at chapter 16 and verse 22. Somebody read that out loud for me. I see that hand, Joel. <laughs> Close enough. What did he do? He wrote down. Now, according to seminary, and I, look, I paid for it. I got to use it sometime. He is what is called an amanuensis. An amanuensis is somebody that would write down what someone dictated to them. And so Paul, what he did is he sat down and he talked and this gentleman wrote down what Paul said and so he is called an amanuensis and that's why he he inserted that in chapter 16 verse 22 just so that he, and there was one passage I think it was in I think it was Galatians where Paul actually wrote the letter himself and he, he even said you can tell by what large letters I use that I have written this letter which makes most of us think that he probably had a difficulty with his eyes but let's read our text for today this is in Romans chapter 16 verses 25 through 27 and Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. There's the word we're going to be focusing on. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed. And through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. These are Paul's last words to the Romans. And in my perspective, as I have kind of spent 
my time with Paul and the gentleman who was the amanuensis, uh, from my perspective, this is probably one of the most significant words in the whole book. They are also significant for us because it talks about how we have come to believe and what God does when anyone believes. Now, the point that I want to make today is that salvation is just as much a miracle as when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now, you've been here before. I want you to go there again. And if you have Ephesians chapter 1. And if you didn't mark it the first time, I want you to mark it this time and put beside it in the, in the uh, what do they call that little part on the side? Margin, thank you. In the margin, I want you to put Romans chapter 16. Now here's what Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God in Ephesians chapter 1, 16, in verse 16. Now, now, now I want you to listen to this closely. I want us, when we, as we read this, to read it together slowly. Here's what Paul writes. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, now let's slow down, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Now notice, let's stop right there. When it comes to the spirit of wisdom, we know it's the Holy Spirit. Who is it? How do we get him? How do we receive him? It's from God. It's not something that we go and do. It is something that Paul is saying that God gives to them. That God may give you the spirit of wisdom and of what? Revelation in the knowledge of him. Again, we need to really get this. That the, the reason, in the, and by the way, the book of Ephesians is the only book Paul wrote that does not have a specific name in it. In, in Romans, you know, he names name after name. And that's because the book of Ephesians was meant to be a circular letter. In other words, he sent it to the church in Ephesus and they were supposed to send it to the other congregations in the other cities. So this was a, a well-written book. But notice it says that, that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Which means that every one of us who believe, it is because God Almighty himself through the Holy Spirit revealed it to us and that is why we believe keep reading he says having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you there is another element an aspect of the power and the in, and the uh, integral part of God working in us so that we grasp and understand scripture I know you've probably been around people who are reading the Bible and they just don't get it. And yet when we read it, it, it's like it's so clear to us. Well, the reason it is clear to us is not because of something or anything we have done ourselves. It's because of the power of God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit have worked in us to reveal in our minds and in our eyes what our salvation is about. And notice it so it says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That gives us a, a, an attitude of, of heavenly calling. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So there he is saying that the reason that we look for, the reason they wrote songs about heaven, the reason we sing those songs, the reason they they lift our hearts and our spirits it's because of what the Holy Spirit has done for us so that we're able to embrace that. And look at verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward who? Us. Us who 
believe. That is very important is that the power of God Almighty is toward us who believe. And look at, th look at this. Here's the part I want you to have underlined. I want you to have highlighted. I want you to put an asterisk on the side. I want you to put a star in the top and draw a line down to this verse. Okay? Say okay. Okay, good. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The very same power of almighty God that raised Jesus from the dead and sat him at God's right hand is the exact same power that it took and God used to save us. Now, guys, that to me is just, and I've told you this, and I know at least twice, and I've brought it up a third time because you're supposed to hear something 13 times before you get it, so you got 10 more coming, okay? But right here is to understand why we believe. It's because of the power of God that took place. And this is one of the most significant passages in all of the scripture because Paul explains his prayer for God to do what we cannot do. That happens in the life and the spirit and the soul of every believer. The reason you get it, the reason you understand, the reason you love the word, the reason there are passages that you embrace and songs that you love to sing are because of the working of the power of God that also took place when Jesus Christ was resurrected. Now, I want you to know that God, the Lord Jesus, the Father, is the one who initiates everything related to salvation. Everything. If God did not initiate what it takes or took or for us to be saved, it wouldn't happen. And the reason is because we're all dead. We're all spiritually dead. And as I've asked you before, as we've talked about before, as we've said before, a dead man can't do anything. And a spiritually dead person needs someone to do that, to initiate it, so that there is salvation. And so in verse 17, we see that God gives the spirit of wisdom to understand Scripture. That means that God enlightens the eyes of our heart to know salvation. And the result of God enlightening the heart is the eternal hope to which we are called. Not only that, we comprehend from God the glorious riches of our eternal salvation. One of the things I love to do, I love singing Christmas hymns. I really do. We ought to sing them all, all year. But I love, 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 love singing songs about heaven. Because that's that's where I'm that's what I'm looking to. That's what we're looking forward to. It's heaven, and that is what God has put in us. Because God reveals to believers the supernatural power for us who believe, which is the same power God used to raise Jesus from the dead. I mean, think of that. And then he seated him at the right hand of God the Father. That is something, honestly, brothers and sisters, we ought to sit down after we leave here today, open the book to, to Ephesians chapter 1, and read that little section slowly, and then more slowly, and then even more slowly, getting the phrases that are those nuggets of gold and diamonds that are for us. Because God reveals to believers the supernatural power for us to believe. It's the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead and seat him at the right hand of God. 
And that is what brought us from spiritual death to eternal life. So now go back to Romans 16. I want us to read it again. Because we've got a little bit more floating around in our gray matter and in our heart about our salvation and about how it has taken place in the power of God. In Romans chapter 16, beginning in, beginning in verse 25, let, let's, let's read it. Let's read it slow. Now to him who is able. You know what that implies? Somebody is not able. And so when he says now to him who is able, he is pointing to Jesus Christ who has the power, who, has, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Listen, one of the things that happens when you come to worship on Sunday morning is that your tank is, it should be filled with the Holy Spirit through the songs that we sing, the lessons we study, the prayers that we pray, the scripture that we hear, and the messages that are brought. That we should leave here with a, with a reflection about the awesome power of God who is in us and the result of what that means. It says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, preaching the Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. Do you know what that phrase means right there, long ages? It means all of creation since Adam and Eve all the way up to when Jesus was born. That's what he means by uh, long ages. Because, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But notice in verse 26, but has now been disclosed. In other words, he said, nobody's understood. It's been a mystery. But in my son, guess what? Now I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to show you my plan. I'm going to show you where it all started, why it all started, how it's going to, how it's going to happen right now and how it's going to end. But it's now been disclosed and through prophetic writings has been made known. Again, that's the power of God. You know, that what happens there is we're reading something, boom, the light goes on. That's the activity of the Holy Spirit. Has been made known to all nations. That's the preaching of the gospel. According to the command of the eternal God. And what's the point? Here it is. To bring about the obedience of faith. In other words, for people to be saved. So that those who hear the gospel can come to him so as to be saved. And then we have verse 27. To the only wise God be glory forever more through Jesus Christ. Amen. And, it's, uh, and that's where the letter ends. But I want you to look in this passage here, 25 through 27, a few phrases. The first one we've already mentioned, we won't take any time there. Him who is able. able. Then there's the phrase, according to the revelation. We've mentioned that already. And he talks about the mystery that was kept secret, but has now been disclosed, has been made known. All those phrases are about the revelation of God to salvation and understanding the scripture. And I want you to get this. I really want you to understand what I'm about to say here. If you are a believer in Christ, if you understand the scriptures, I'm not saying you're going to understand all of them. I'm going to get to that one in just a minute too. But I want you to understand of how active God has been and is in your life now to comprehend the gospel of eternal salvation and what he has done for you and the reason he did it is because of his love. So, so that is something that we are given, something that, that can be personal, something that between two believers, since we're two or more are gathered, that he's in their midst. There are times, I'll guarantee it's happened to everybody here, when you're reading the scripture, listening to a gospel song, watching a, a Christian movie where you are just you are, are moved to a point of worship because of that. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And it's not something that you did on your own. You remember I call it 
passive participant is that God said, you're mine, and I'm going to open your mind. And, and guess what? How many degrees do you have to have to understand the word of God? None. Zero. A child can understand it. That is how beautiful the gospel is, is it's simple and easy for anyone to understand. Now, in these phrases, the one that, that gets me the most as I was studying this is the phrase, has been made known. That is, uh, I think it's in verse 26. Now, that's huge. That's important. What's the last book in the Old Testament? This is a test. Fritz guy. Malachi. Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And then, do you know how many years there were between Malachi and the birth of Jesus? You remember? 400 years of silence. There were no prophets. There were no preachers. God didn't send any angels. There was nothing. 400 years of silence. Even though what was hinted out about the Messiah in the Old Testament, they didn't start coming to fruition until the birth of Christ and he fulfilled every prophecy as the Messiah. Turn to John 12. I'll get there in a minute, but y'all go ahead and turn there. Paul wrote Romans 16. This is not going to be a revelation to you. But Paul wrote Romans 16, and the verse in particular that we are looking at, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what I want to say about the book of Romans, about the Bible which we are about to read in John chapter 12, is that unless God reveals himself to a person, they not only will not believe, but they cannot believe. And guys, that's what I want you to get. That's what I want us all to get this. That the only reason we believe is because of God. And that's why we worship. That's why we praise. Because, and I'm going to do something with this passage, so don't get upset as we're reading it. People tend to get upset when I read this passage, but I'm going to change it a little bit today and hope I don't get struck dead by lightning. Amen. Amen. Goodness gracious, y'all got to help me out here a little bit. John chapter 12, let's begin reading in verse 37. Though he, and the he there refers to Jesus. Though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Now, that's a statement. But there's an explanation in verse 38. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord! Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then the answer from God comes in verse 39. Therefore, why does it say could not there? What does it say in y'all's translation? Could not? Are you sure it doesn't say would not? Let that settle in. Therefore, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he, talking about God. What did, what's the first thing God did? He blinded their eyes. What's the second thing God did? He hardened their heart. Because what would have happened if God hadn't blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, the rest of the verse, what would have happened? They would have believed. Now, when people read that, they get all worked up. I can remember one deacon. 
I'm not going to tell you which church it was at, but it was before this one. We were talking on a Sunday night, and he had asked a question, and I, we can't, I took a group, it was about 14, 15 of us, to this passage, and we read it, and I did just what I did with y'all. I have never seen a gentleman breathe so hard and fast and eyes get and face get so red and sweat like I did him because he didn't like the scripture. You see, the thing it is about scripture is it's not there for us to determine whether or not to believe it. This is the <coughs> word of God. And you know what I say is the best thing to do? When you read the word of God, believe it. Believe it. And all you have to do is to look at it. You know, there, I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, there are sometimes I feel like I don't need to preach. I just say, I'm going to read the Bible and y'all listen. Because God has the Holy Spirit and he's revealing it to you. So we get here. And in verse 40, what we find out is that God blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. In other words, and this is just simply mirroring what God says here, what is written in the Bible is that if God hadn't have done that, they would have believed. Now, let's, let's make ourselves feel a little better about this passage, okay? Uh, I want to flip that. I, this came to me this morning. Hope is from God. But let, let's change that passage a little bit. Instead of God blinding eyes and hardening hearts so they cannot believe, what if we think of it this way? That God gives grace to his own so that they will repent and will believe and will have faith in God so as to be saved. What about that? Is that not what happens with us? Is that not what revelation is? Is that not what has now has been hidden for ages, but is now revealed? Is that not what God has done for us? And does that make us feel haughty or proud? No. What it does is it puts us on our face before God to realize that outside of his gracious, kind mercy, that would be us. And the fact that we do believe, that we have repented, that we do have faith, means that it's a praise to God for those things. And we worship him because of how great and awesome he is. Thus, here's what we read in Ephesians. This is, you don't have to turn here, you know the passage by heart. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 through 10, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. My daughter Amy used to say doing. It's not your own doing. And then he says, it is the gift of God. Now that word it means everything. The gift that God gives us is repentance, is faith, is belief. Those are the gifts from God that he gives to us so that we can believe. It believe it's not because of works being good coming to church giving your money getting baptized uh, serving as a preacher or a deacon it's not none of those things matter the only thing that matters is of what God has done and the result is is that we're his workmanship which God prepared that we should do now, I bring that up to keep reminding us to have a good, solid theology of who salvation is of. It's all of God. And if it's not all of God, it's not a biblical salvation. Turn to Luke 24. And get your pen because I'm about to tell you a verse you'll want to read later. From creation until Jesus' day, God's complete eternal plan was hidden. It was even kept a secret from those who wrote the Old Testament. Some things of God are still hidden. Here's where I want you to write down a passage. Deuteronomy 29, 29. 
Because what is written there are these words. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. That we may do all the words of his law. You know, every now and then somebody will ask me a question. What do you think God was thinking? Or what do you think God's intention was? I've even wondered that. You know, what, what is God thinking here? Well, you know, there are still a lot of things going on and happening that are in the secrecy of God. But there's plenty of things that God has revealed to us that are ours forever so that we may proclaim his word. Now, you're in Luke 24. Because as Paul wrote in Romans 16, God revealed his son. He revealed his plan in salvation. So what I want to do now is to... Let me see. I'm only going. I'm only going to be able to read. Goodness, two more passages, and then we're going to come back and look look at some more of it tonight, if whoever comes. Did I tell you what chapter? Twenty four. Did I tell you what verse? Thirty two. This is the road to Emmaus. When I say that word, you have you have memories automatically. I've I've read this before, but let's read it a little closer. Those who were walking with Jesus now converse with each other. Verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Do you see that? The reason these people understood the scripture as they were on the road to Emmaus was not because of something that they had figured out on their own or had had some um, great boom in their in their brain about it it was because Jesus opened the scripture and revealed it to them skip down now to verse 44 Jesus is the one speaking then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. He's talking about prior to the crucifixion and resurrection. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In the Hebrew mind, he just said the Old Testament because they called it the Law of Moses, first five books, <clears throat> the Prophets, all the other books, then you have the Psalms, those are the wisdom literatures. But now look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. You see, that's why we go to the Scriptures. That's why the Old Testament is of eminent importance. And for anybody to, to throw away the Old Testament is to contradict the very word of Jesus Christ himself before the New Testament was ever set to pen and paper. And you know what denomination I'm talking about. And you know what preacher I'm talking about in that land. Verse 46, And he said to them, about what is in the Old Testament. He's going to give them an encapsulated version of what is in the Old Testament. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That is the roadmap of conversion for every single person who has or does or ever will believe. That is how conversion happens. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit opens a person's mind to understand the scripture. And so if, when we believe, it is because of the revelation of God. Do you get that? You wonder 
Has God ever spoken to me? Yes. If you were a believer, you may not have heard him audibly, but I'll guarantee you he was speaking to your heart. And by the way, also, if you want to hear God's voice verbally, then read the Bible out loud. If you want to hear God speak verbally, read the scripture because that's his word. If you believe, it is always because of God's revelation. Now, I'm going to read one more passage and then we're going to finish up with it tonight, okay? Uh, I know y'all are going to bring finger foods and, and you know, all that. We'll, we'll just eat them in here, okay? We'll use a plate. But we're going to keep studying. Turn to Ephesians. Do you remember where Ephesians is? Because I want to read one more scripture for your edification. Now, I love the wording of this in the new in the uh, English Standard Version. I love the, the wording of it. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, here's what we read. <clears throat> in Jesus... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now, here it comes, which he lavished upon us. I love the way they worded that. Well, when you think about the word of someone having something lavished upon them, what do you think about? You know what I think about? I think about guys that used to go to, to the barber shop to get shaved, and they would put one of those little things in a cup and, and you know it had a bunch of horse hair or something in it and then they would just put the, the stuff all over that's what I think of when I, when I read this idea of the grace that he lavished upon us I think of God's love and grace and mercy being from head to toe so much you can't even see my body through the love and the grace and the mercy of God which he lavished upon us, talking about his grace, in all wisdom and insight. Now look at verse 9 again. Making known to us. What does that mean? He made known to us. We didn't figure it out. God revealed it. Always remember that. Making known to us the mystery of his will. According to his purpose. Which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. By the way, we're not done with the fullness of time yet. There was one fullness of time when Jesus was born of a virgin. The other fullness of time is going to be when God sets up his kingdom on earth. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. Those last two phrases, to unite all things in him and things in heaven and on earth. You know what that's talking about? The glory of a family of God that God has, has gotten rid of the universe of sin and he has recreated everything into his perfect perfection and we are together with him in glory. That's what he's talking about here. Things in heaven and things on earth. Now, I know I've gone fast. I know I've gone fast. I know I've given you a lot of scripture. I'm going to try to upload it this afternoon. But my goal, my desire, my hope, my prayer this morning has been to expose you to the scriptures and the truth of God to the extent and to the point that you become humbled before him like you have never been humbled before so that you realize that your salvation is not of you. It is completely, absolutely from beginning to end of God. And because of that, we are his children adopted and will reign with him forever. And that when the day comes that the trumpet sounds, we're going to heaven. And when we think about those of our loved ones who have passed from this life and are in the next, what they already have is the 33-year-old self that is standing with Jesus Christ in glory waiting on us. And by the way, do you know how long it's going to take from their perspective for us to be with them? Do you know? Do you know how long it's going to take? 
Pam got it right that quick. Now, it may seem like a couple of decades to us, but to them, it's not going to be anything. And you know what? One more thing, one more thing, one more thing. When we get there to heaven, do you know who the first person we're going to want to see is? God, Jesus. We're going to want to put our arms around him and hug him. We'll get to all the family and friends and dogs or whoever later. But guys, do you realize what would have happened if God had left us alone in our sin? And I want us to, th I want us to think of those who are our friends and family that don't know Christ. And to talk with them about him. If nothing else, give your testimony. What a perfect time when it's Christmas and everybody is sitting around and everybody's got presents and you say, hey, y'all, can I, can I tell you about my present? And tell them about Jesus. The Christians there will be nodding their heads saying amen. The other ones will roll their eyes, but you know what might happen? The Holy Spirit might get a hold of them. And then them too are given the revelation of Jesus Christ and come to salvation. But with all that said, I really do hope that what we have looked at today has engendered in each of us a desire to praise and worship God and to realize how awesome of a God it is that we serve. And why in the world would he love me? Because I'll guarantee you, Jesus had to love me before I was born because he wouldn't have a reason to love me after. And I ain't going to tell y'all what all that means. None of y'all the business. But let's bow and pray for a moment. God, not a one of us sitting here today has all knowledge. Not a one of us sitting here today is perfect. But I pray that every one of us here today knows you. And that if there are any who may watch this someday, that you would open their minds and hearts to your Holy Spirit, and that they would come to know your Son for salvation. And God, also for those who we know that do not believe in Christ according to Scripture, give us the boldness Give us the desire and opportunity to share Christ with them. And that if it so be your will, to give them light so as to be saved. In Christ's name, amen. One eleven. One eleven.